one thing is certain if you stick to the word you will come back with a testimony what God wants to give you in your life is not a healing what God wants to give you in your life is not a job what God wants to give you in your life is not money what God wants to give you is the word of God in your spirit it will make you what it talks about and you are shining and you are shining by the power of the Holy Ghost you are shining by the power of the Holy Ghost you are shining and nothing can stop you it is your season it is your time nothing can hinder you this is your time this is your hour favor is yours Are you ready? The book of Romans. Chapter 1. We'll just read a few and then go into chapter 2 and see what's going on. He begins to... to um, because you see, he's writing to a Gentile church. Most of the people in the church of Rome, or shall we say in the churches in Rome at the time, these fellowships, you remember I told you, they didn't have um, well-structured churches because of the persecution. So, most of the members of these churches were Gentiles, okay? And he knew that since the message of Jesus Christ came from the Jews, they will have a lot of respect for the Jews. Paul was a very intelligent person. He knew they would have a lot of respect for the Jews. And so, any message coming from the Jews would likely be accepted. So he knew that it was good for him to help them to get balanced on the truth. So he begins to um, condemn the wrongs. Are you ready? Then he goes, verse 18, For the rod of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, who suppress the truth. In unrighteousness because that which may be known of God that which may be known about God is manifest in them for God had showed it unto them for the invisible now verse 20 is a very enlightening scripture I, I read it here for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and God here so that they are without excuse now he's speaking generally of human beings all over the world <clears throat> and he says the invisible things of God from the creation from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made in other words there are things of the spirit that we do not see there are invisible things of the spirit that may be unknown to us or that we do not see. And uh, these very things that we may feel are not real or we do not know how to relate with them. He says we can understand them by the things that can be seen. By the things that are made. Hallelujah. Such that by looking at things that are made, by looking at things that can be seen... You are without excuse. So you just don't say, well, since I can't see it, I can't believe it. He says, there are things you can see that are proof enough. And you can understand certain spiritual realities through physical things. So he's saying there. All right, verse 21. Because, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. It's talking about he then man. When they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Isn't that just like a lot of people? And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. See? Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the loss of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. He says God actually gave them up to do what they were doing. 
because he already put on enough signs out there for them to know of his reality. If they might feel after him. But no, they changed the glory of God for that which they desired after. So God gave them up. Now look at verse 20, 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshipped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Isn't that true? We find people worshipping wood and worshipping a, a cow or worshipping some image. See, they worship the creature more than the creator. Praise God. For this course, look at verse 26. For this course, God gave them up unto vile affections. Now, when it says God gave them up, that don't mean that God grabbed the guy like this and said, now you go for vile affections. No. In other words, he, he withdrew from them. You know, when you give up something. See, he withdrew from them and allowed them to go in their own ways. Someone has said the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. I like that. Okay, verse 26. For this cause God gave them up under vile affections, for even their women did change or exchange the natural use into that which is against nature. You know what that means? Huh. But by reading the next one, you know what that first one means because they're talking about the same thing. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust, one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly. Have you heard of homosexuals? You see, they didn't start last week. See? The hom homosexuals have been there a long time. And you see, Paul is talking here about things that have been happening, not just happening in his day. If you read back in Genesis, you'll remember the, the city of Sodom. They saw angels come into the house of Lot, who came as men. And these this men of the city came. They came knocking on, on Lot's door. They said, we, we saw uh, strangers come into your house today. There are two men in your house. Bring them out. We want them. They came as homosexuals. And they were so, so mad at Lot and hidden his door. And they said, we want them. They didn't know they were angels. And Lot, Lot was so, the Bible says that Lot was a righteous man. And that his righteous soul was vexed from day to day by the evil life that these people were living. It's important where you live. Sometimes you have to move your house. I'm telling you. I, no, no, no. See, there's a time when you can really preach to certain folks. But there's a time when... Your spirit will become corrupted if you don't go. I'm not saying that you start looking for... Look, you, you just have to be careful in your life. If you... <laughs> are you in this place? There are things that... The Bible says that every day, Lord's righteous soul was vexed. That means provoked to compromise. Provoked to compromise. His righteous soul was vexed from day to day until he no longer, he became passive. He, was, he, didn't, he just really didn't care anymore. Must have been preaching to them and they weren't listening to him. So, But see, you keep seeing those things and seeing those things and seeing those things. You lose your, 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 uh, your, your fire. Here's what the man did. By the time they were asking him for these two, these two men who came into his house, he said, I have daughters. Let me give you my daughters. He was right because he knew they were evil. And then the angels came and they pulled Lot in and said, let's, let's deal with them. Come. <laughs> and of course they did, you know. Praise the Lord. See? That's the time you, you just you can't continue in certain things for too long. The spirit provoked from day to day. You have a beer parlor and you're a Christian. <laughs> I think one day you will start drinking beer. <laughs> I'm telling you. It won't be long before you are carried drunk. Because every day these guys will come into your beer parlor and drink and drink and drink and drink and drink. And you, are be, you will be watching them. You want their money? Okay. So you, they pay you and you say, to God be the glory for this money I receive. I shall tie it unto the Lord. If it was unclean, it's now clean. 
<laughs> you keep it. They come in there, you don't like the way they look, you don't like the way they talk, but you are there every day, every day. Or you have a restaurant, and these kind of guys always come in there all the time, all the time, all the time. And you can't decide how people should behave in your restaurant or in your bar or whatever it is. One day, one day, you would be like them. One day. That's why I tell people, those of you who say you have a ministry to prostitutes, I warn you. <laughs> Honestly. I can understand some guys, they just, two of them, just two of them, they say, Father, in the name of Jesus, you are sending us to those prostitutes, we are going in your name. I say, brother, come back home. <laughs> I'm telling you. Listen, listen, it, it's very important. See, I believe that the Holy Spirit helps us and he sends us. See, but you see, If your ministration continues for too long in that place, see, he sends us, that's what he called, into every man's world. He says, go into all the world. It's your world. Every man's world. What, what he will do, he will win one of them prostitutes and send that one back there to bring them out. You that has never been a prostitute, you go in there, you may not come out. Yes, because you see, you have not yet developed, you have not developed a dislike for certain things. You come in there and you start seeing certain things you don't understand. But this guy that has been inside there as a prostitute now despises the smell of the place, despises everything. She understands it all. She hates the very thing that she sees there and wants to go out because now she's saved. So when she comes back here to talk to all these people, she wants to take them out. But you have never been in here. He will not send you here. He knows. To bring you here, you will see things you never saw before. Things you thought were bad, but now you are thinking they are good. You have to be careful. You see, we, we, we are not led by sympathy. You don't say, oh, I just sympathize. Or you're just driving your car. You see this lady standing there. She's looking so pretty. And you say, oh, Lord Jesus, why should such a pretty person uh, be a prostitute? Yeah, you are looking at the outward appearance. What is pretty about what you're seeing? Because she's pretty, you pack by the road and say, come in. <laughs> I'll tell you what will happen by tomorrow morning. You're going to be saying, forgive me, oh God. Yeah, because, because you walk by sight. You see, you walk by sight. Just like some people, when we tell them to go win people to Christ, they start looking for somebody they think is soft. Haven't you found out? Those guys you thought were soft, by the time they start arguing about Jesus Christ, you say, my God, who sent me here? But the other guy you thought was so loud, he wouldn't even listen. He just calms down and he listens to the word. See, it's not by sight. Don't feel sorry for somebody because of the, the look as if ah, this one needs to be in the kingdom. So it's people like you that God is looking for. Oh, you're wrong. You are wrong. You are wrong because all the flesh you see would make from the same old dust. It just depends on the shape of your nose. Who says it's good? Do you understand what I'm talking about? So don't be carried away by the outward appearance. God says a man looks on the outward appearance, but he, God, looks in the heart. And it's the heart that really matters. Hallelujah. All right, so there we go. Romans chapter 1 and um, <clears throat> verse... Verse 27 says, And likewise also the men live in the natural use of a woman, burning their loss one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was due or which was made. And even as they did not, I want you to observe this, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. There are certain people who don't like to retain God in their knowledge. There are people who were brought up going to church. As they grew up, they decided to reject it. Now, there are parents, and if you're, if you're among them, you really have to think about this and change. There are parents who say, 
In our home, we let everybody decide. Whatever you want to serve, that's not a Christian home. In a Christian home, there is a standard. Train up a child in the way he should go. Not train up a child and let him go how he wants to go. No, train up a child in the way he should go. Not even in the way you want him to go. In the way he should go. How should he go? This word. I love Kenneth Hagin's story. He said that when he first began to beat his son, whip him, the son, oh, that's it. he said, now the Bible says that when you do things like this, I should whip you. He said he showed it to him from the Bible and trashed him. I think that's good. My dad used to put his own on, on top of the wardrobe. Whenever we did something nasty, we knew where we were going when he said, come. He'll bring that thing from up there and then, oh boy. (laughs) Hallelujah. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he's old, the Bible says he will not depart from it. Don't say, oh, no, no, no. I decided that our home is uh, democracy. He's not democracy. (laughs) Hallelujah. Your children must go in the way the Lord has said to go. You cannot entertain a child who says he's not going to church. Is she kidding? What are you talking about? Hey, we're going to church and that little rascal, 12 years old, says I'm not going. Or 15 years old. I was in a shopping mall and um, my little girl she was really misbehaving. She'll hold on to something and say, that, well, except we buy that thing. All right, then she'll go, ah! And I remember all the cameras are on us. You know, it's not like, <laughs> all the cameras are there. And they're going to be watching you and recording all those things. Anything you do to that child is on record. Then I said, when we get home. <laughs> I said, when we get home. Then I held her hand and she pulled her hand up. Then I went close to her. I picked the hand again. I said, when we get home. (laughs) You know, because the cameras are there and I... All right. You know, you you start dealing with the child, then the police will come for you. It's okay. I just let her have her way. When we finished, we got into the car. Today... You will learn never to do that again. She knew I was serious. When we got home, and that was about quite a long drive, when we got home, the park in the car was just walking in. As we got close to the door, she stopped working. I noticed she wasn't following me. I said, come here. She stopped there. She said, sorry, daddy. <laughs> Hallelujah. (laughs) Don't let a child have his way or her way. Because that's the meaning of a child. A child cannot, cannot decide for himself or herself. Don't say it's what they want to. No, they cannot want. You give them what they need. Then there are things they may ask for they want. Yes, you, as far as you know, that's not dangerous. You wouldn't buy a loaded gun for your child, would you? I'll tell you how he will start. He'll say, Daddy, watch it. <laughs> He'll start with you. <laughs> Hallelujah. So there are some things, you know, that, that, as the Spirit of God, you know, God leads us into in ministry as we're learning. Some of you, just your uncle saying, is it that church? Stop going. To... You, you even start, you feel like dying just because of what he said about you going to church. How much more when people are out against you in a major way? Then there are things sometimes you can't stand. And God lets you grow from one stage to another. See? Because there are things you cannot handle. I love Ken Copeland's story. I tell you this. He said, you know, he's, he's a good pilot. He flies an airplane. And um, 
One time he went to a certain level while he was flying in the air. And then he wanted to go higher, but he couldn't because um, the, the controllers hadn't let him go. See? From the control tower. They hadn't let him go. And then um, they gave him the signal later on and they said he could go some more thousands of feet higher. And then he went higher. And then um, he had to stop there. And then he was listening and waiting for a signal to go higher. He couldn't go higher and was waiting until they gave him the signal. Now, they could give him the signal. He wouldn't know what's happening there. When the place is clear, they'll give him the signal to go higher. He had to listen for the signals from those who were controlling. Why? Because they're the ones who could tell whether it was clear to go or not to go. You see? There's some things you cannot handle at certain levels. And God will not take you there to that level because he knows that that area, boy, it's busy. <laughs> it's busy with all kinds of fights. You come in there, you may crash. So he doesn't let you go there. And you're saying, oh God, I want to go higher. And say, oh, not, not, not yet. See? Are you following what I'm talking about? So when that area is clear now, then he takes you up higher. Then there's another level. And when he sees feet to let you go up higher, then he'll let you go up higher. So you can trust him to lead you in your life and to guide you. You can trust him. Praise God. You don't need to fight for yourself ever. All right. Verse 28. And as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, babiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, <laughs> disobedient to parents. Hmm, did you see that? Without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, impeccable, unmerciful. I mean, that's bad company. What do you think? Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which do such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. He says, these people know the judgment of God. They know that God is against these things, but they not only do them, they have pleasure in those that do them. Birds of the same feathers flock together. But watch now, he's indicting everybody. Huh? The spiritual Paul is indicting everybody here. So, but um, there's a certain group of people who, while he's writing this, don't think they are included. And he is really going for these folks. I want you to see this. Chapter 2. He's really going for them. From verse 1. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judges. For wherein thou judges another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judges doest the same things. But we are sure that the mercy, the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man that judgest, that judges them which do such things, and doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. He's actually addressing the Jews now. He's addressing the Jews now because they, there's a certain teaching among the Jews that uh, Abraham, you know, some held that Abraham was in his bosom waiting for the righteous to come in. Then there was another school of thought among the Jews that um, Abraham was standing at the gates of hell. You know what he's doing? He's not letting any Jew go to hell. Standing at the gates of hell and any Jew that comes, he'll say, this way. You're not going to hell. So they believe that they will escape the judgment of God. And that's what Paul is talking about here. That thinkest thou this O man that judgest them which do such things. And doest the same that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. You see, what has he done? He has labored men, sinners, in the first chapter. In that chapter one we're reading. He has labored them, sinners, because of their works. He has condemned them because of their works. You notice he was talking about their works. Um, haters of God, despiteful, proud, and all this. So he's condemned them by their works. Now he looks at another group here that doesn't think that they, they, they have evil works because they have the law. So he says, you who think that you're so free. Hmm. Watch it. He says, 
Do you think you would escape the judgment of God? Or despises, verse 4, or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasures up unto thyself wrought against the day of wrath in revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Okay, go to verse 17. Now, you see, he's, he's going down the line on the same thought. Now, he goes, verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and resteth in the law, and makest thy boast of God. Are you seeing it now? Say, listen, this whole book, this whole book takes off from the 16th verse of chapter 1, and then begins to give you a light of the reason for his arguments when you start reading from the 17th verse here now. So he goes, see, he's condemned the whole world, and then um, he looks at the Jews, and he says, I I I know with all these things I'm saying, you don't think you're included. All right, now, you Jews. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and rested in the law, and makest thy boast of God, and knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. Can you see that? And art confident that thou thyself are the guide of the blind, a light of them which are in darkness. That's what you think you are. <laughs> All right. An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. Thou therefore who teachest another, teachest thou not thyself. Thou that preachest the man should not steal. Dost thou steal? Hmm. Are you following this? Okay. Thou that says the man should not commit adultery. Dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that, that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonorest thou God? For the name of God. Hmm. This is very important. This verse we just were reading now. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you. It's because of your behavior that people don't believe in Almighty God. That's what he's saying. His name is blasphemed through you. They look at your life and then they they, they don't believe in him. Is that true of you today? You have to be careful. See, people should look at your life and tell that Jesus must be a good Jesus. What do you think? Praise the Lord. All right. Oh, where am I? Okay. Verse 25, for circumcision. Now, you understand circumcision. The Jews were circumcised. I know that uh, all over the world, uh, many, many places, they circumcise people today. But it's not the kind of circumcision they're doing today. What do I mean? The, the one they're doing today doesn't have a meaning except that my great-grandfather circumcised my grandfather, my grandfather, you know, all that kind of stuff. But this was because of the covenant. Are you hearing this? This was because of the covenant. There was a covenant. So the circumcision was connected to the covenant. Not just because they felt it was good to circumcise. And by the way, they were not the only people who were circumcised in in those days. But their own circumcision was based on the covenant. Are you hearing me? All right. Now, he says, for circumcision verily profited if thou keep the law. You see, if you're circumcised because of the law, you see, now look at this. God gave the children of Israel laws, but the laws were based on the covenant. Now, I want you to understand something. When God made a covenant with Abraham, there was no law. Hello? There was no law. When he made a covenant with Abraham, there was no law. He made promises, and there was no law. The Bible says that the law was added Because of transgressions. The law was added. The law was not there before. Which means the law was subject to the covenant. Not the covenant being subject to the law. But they exalted the law above the covenant. Oh, yes. So when a child, when a Jewish child was born, he was circumcised. That circumcision was the sign in his body that he was in the covenant with Jehovah. And that he would keep the law because the, law, the, 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 the circumcision now became a part of the law. 
In other words, it was now part of the law to circumcise the children. But the law came after the covenant. Circumcision was a sign, a token of the covenant. All right? But here, there were changes now. What's going on here? Look at it. He says, 25, circumcision verily profited if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of, of the law, thy circumcision is made on circumcision. He said, if you are circumcised because of the covenant. And now God has given us laws that we should keep the law if we are in the covenant. That is a proof of our relationship in the covenant. Now, if you do not keep the law and yet you are circumcised, then your circumcision is made void. Because you do not keep the law, which was given for us to ratify this relationship. So now you don't keep it. It's a sign that you believe in the covenant because it was added because of transgressions. So when you break the law, you break the covenant. That's what Paul is teaching. Are you following this? Now watch it, we're going somewhere. Therefore, verse 26, therefore if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? And shall not uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law? For he is not a Jew. This is the big one. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit. And not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. Hallelujah. See, Paul had come to the conclusion that circumcision is not just something in your body, but in the heart. How come David knew that he was a circumcised man and Saul didn't know? David knew that if you're circumcised, you're in the covenant, and that by virtue of that covenant, you cannot be defeated. How come Saul didn't know? And Saul was afraid of the giant. How come? Because the consciousness of the circumcision was not in his heart. The consciousness of the circumcision was not in his heart. I ask you a question too. Do you know that you have been circumcised in the heart? Do you know that you have been circumcised in your spirit? There is a circumcision according to the Bible. I'm not just making it up. It's, it's there. It's written here. We've been circumcised in the heart, in the spirit. Now, if you have been circumcised in the spirit, it means that that is the token of the new covenant. Now, if it is there, do you realize that you cannot be defeated? Do you realize that in your life you cannot fail? Do you realize it? it, it maybe for some people it hasn't dawned on you. You know, the Bible tells us that one day it dawned on David that he was king. It just dawned on him that he was king. He didn't realize it before. Yeah, and he had been king for some time. And so, suddenly just, he just awakened to that reality. Look, man, that's the way for some people. See, as, as long as you're not aware that you have eternal life in you, there's a life you will live. There's a life you will live. You live a life that is ordinary, a life that is at the most religious. You're thankful to him. Today you have this sickness, you have that disease, you have... Oh, praise the Lord Jesus. Do you know that there is nothing in your life, in your body today, that cannot be changed? Are you aware that as long as you are on this earth, in this physical body, everything except that which has come from God is subject to change? Everything is subject to change. Every condition is subject to change. 
Even if you came in here without one hand today, you have only one hand and the other one has been amputated. Do you know that your condition is subject to change? You see, until you come to that awareness, you have not yet understood this. Let me read something to you. See, this book of Romans, I said it's powerful. Are you following me? It's so important that you follow the, 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 the teaching line upon line. Precept upon precept, like he says, all right? Okay, let me show you something in the book of John here. Um, this is um, 1 John, chapter number 5. That's in chapter 5? No, I, I, it's chapter... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, chapter 5. First epistle of St. John, chapter number 5. I am reading verse 13. It is one of the biggest portions. Hallelujah. Most powerful. Somebody says, you always speak one scripture and say, this is the most. I don't know which of them now is the most. (laughs) Well, as you're blessed with them, you know. Verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Oh, God. You know, when I meditate on that scripture, I I just can't stop tears from coming down my eyes. Because here John is writing by the Holy Spirit. And this John who wrote this letter, let me tell you a little about John who wrote this. This was a man that knew that he had eternal life. Christian, I would call it Christian historical tradition. In other words... I do not get it from this, but from some other materials. It is said that John, how John got to be driven and banished to the island of Patmos from where he got the book of Revelation, all right? Now, John, during that great persecution, after he had been arrested, they put him in a big pot to fry him alive. Are you hearing me? They said, we will barbecue him. But they put him in there alive. When the fire had burnt out and was consumed and consumed itself, you know, John stood up. They could not kill him. There was something about John. I, I don't know, some of your Bibles, if you go to the first page in the book of Revelation, you'll see where they would write things like uh, the book of the Revelation of Jesus Christ by St. John the Divine. I don't know whether you have it. Check yours. Uh, if you do have it, just uh, signify by raising up your hand. I want, to, I want to find you. You found it in yours. Good. By St. John the Divine. Good. That's where that story came from. Now look at this. I want to ask a question. Was it only John who was the divine? This is marvelous. John, what they had to do to him, they had to banish him, they had to take him away. They said, this one is not a human being. (laughs) They took him away and left him in the island of Patmos. They left him there. That was the last time that John was heard of. That's the reason some Christians say that John did not die. Because again, remember the words of the Lord Jesus Christ when Peter asked him, what shall this man do? And Jesus said, if I will, that he should tarry till I come back. What is that to you? You remember that? Then the Bible says people began to say among the, the, the disciples that John would not die. But at that time, if you notice, John couldn't take that yet. He quickly said, but Jesus didn't say that John will not die. Read it there. He quickly disclaimed that. He he, see, he hadn't gotten it yet. Who knows? See, but the day came when John had gotten this message into his system. And now he's the kind of person that the Holy Ghost would help to write this to us and say, I'm writing this to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. You see, he wants it in your present hour consciousness. 
You see, our Christian life is not a religious thing. By the time you realize that you have eternal life, he's telling you the kind of life that is inside you. Now, in biology, I don't know, I hope it's in biology, but it's biology. I didn't read anything beyond biology. Or biology, I'm not a medical person, but biology. Oh, he's my doctor. All right. So, we learn that the human body has the ability to reproduce itself. Is that right? Hmm. That is the physical body with the human life. Doctor, am I correct? Hmm. If someone is injured here and, and the piece is cut out, it has the power to redevelop cells. Is that right? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> that is the human life. Are, are you catching this? That is normal human, and that is the corrupted human life. I want you to remember it's been corrupted. It was better than that. It was better until Adam and Eve messed up. All right? Now, John tells us, he says, I want you to know that you have eternal life. See, it's like a man telling you something that you have on the inside which he wants you to take advantage of. Now, Paul was the one who wrote and said, stir up the gift of God that is in you. And there he was talking about the Holy Ghost. Now, Jesus said, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Now, the Holy Ghost is not the power, but the Holy Ghost does give the power. Now, what is that power? It is the dynamic ability to cause changes. Now, that power is activated in your system. Look, you have to hear this. Are you hearing me? That's why he said, we haven't gotten there yet. That's in the book of Romans. So he said, if the spirit of him that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, he said, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall vitalize your mortal body. In other words, give life to your mortal body. That's what John is talking about. He says, you have eternal life. It's a present hour possession. See, these men were not just people just walking around not knowing where they were going. Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, glory. You have to realize that in your life, there's something about you. Stop begging God in your prayer life. Stop begging because it's not making any difference anyway. Can't you see? Do you like to have children who come? Daddy, please. Breakfast, breakfast. Please. Do you want that? Do you want those kind of children? Please. Or, uh, Daddy, I just want to know if you would like to give me transport fare. Daddy should say no. That's not the kind of son or daughter you give that kind of money to. Haven't you understood that there are different kinds of children? Can't you see that those, those, uh, they don't get anything. In fact, daddy always shouts at them. I don't have any money. Where's the one I gave you before? <laughs> but look at that other one that comes with daddy and he's even putting his hand in daddy's pocket. Right there where daddy is. Ah, daddy, I'm taking this one home. What was daddy saying? Daddy said, ah, no, leave that one for me. Ah, no, I'm taking it home. He will, let, he will take it away in daddy's presence. But the other, and that other one. <laughs> See if it's me now. If it's me, daddy will not give it to me. If it's me. <laughs> Always feeling frustrated. See, daddy doesn't like me. How can daddy like you when you're always doing? That's what daddy doesn't like. You think it's your face? No, it's the way you behave. You're not acting like a son or a daughter. You're acting like a slave. That's what daddy doesn't like. That's the thing. You see, he can't see, he can't see that spirit of a son or a daughter in you. 
keep seeing this slavish thing in you. Mind, daddy. Mind. He, I mean, he, he can't like it. Just looking at you. Daddy has just come. The other one is happy to see daddy. You know, then this other one can. Everybody's coming in. You know, everybody wants to know what daddy or mommy has to say. You know, they, they're just coming in and, ah, just, oh, come and sit down here. Ah, ah, I'm okay. Ah, daddy, good evening. It's been a long day. I didn't see you since morning. You, but this other one can't talk. He just come and say, Hallelujah. And, and you think, how do you think that is looking at her? You know, he, he's fed up. He feels like, where did I get this one from? <laughs> do you know that's the way we act toward God? That's the way we act toward God. And he doesn't like it. Look, he says, I want you to know that you have eternal life. Oh, Hallelujah. I want you to know that you have eternal life. That dear woman, they said the husband has HIV. Say, honey, what happened to you? They said, I have HIV. They said, hell! Oh! <laughs> Instead of thinking about yourself, I say, hey! They said, you have what? <laughs> It's even you they are now holding. Please, please. Oh, hallelujah. No, don't allow anything to kill you. See, relax. Is that why you're afraid? Oh, glory. Open to this. I want you to know that you have eternal life. Hallelujah. And lay your hands there. Look at your hands. Come on, look at your hands. Just look at your hands. Say, these hands are not for doing bad things. God gave them to me to use them to do good things, to change things. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. Hallelujah. He is with us. Amen. 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 Yeah, we'll glorify his holy name. Worship him and thank you. The message that you have just heard is a production of the Love World Media Ministry. For this and other messages by Pastor Chris, visit our Christ Embassy bookstores. Or better still, log on to our website at ChristEmbassyOnlineStore.org. And that's just a click away. God bless you.